this, these last. <laughs> uh, this is any time to read challenge happen, and you know, the thing that has happened is this building. Uh, as as uh, I think Linda Watson's grandson walked in on Easter morning and said, "When where did they put the church?" Because it really is hard to believe in many ways. David, we are so grateful to you for bringing our thoughts and crazy ideas, hoping and looking forward to somehow it all together and turning it into this. So I just asked David to say a few words about what he was thinking in the design process, and then we can ask. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, yeah, this was a really fun project, very uh, unique. Uh, I'm a principal at Doma Studio Architects. Uh, we're a 32-year-old firm. Previously, uh, Lou Dominey was my mentor, uh, a Dominey and Associate Architects, and we did the education building here. I don't know, I've been with the firm 25 years, so it was probably 22 years, somewhere around there, if I recall correctly. Um, so we had a long relationship with your congregation, and I know you've had several attempts trying to get this all to work and looking at new sanctuaries, and so this is just wonderful, and you have a gifted pastor that kind of was a great steward of all your, all your funds looking out, and he still is, trying to wrap up the project with all the uh, outstanding um, issues that we're kind of working through. So when we, we've done over 250 churches all over Southern California, a lot of Presbyterian churches all over um, Orange County and Los Angeles, um, and, and now yours, blessed to be yours. And one of the things that we have learned uh, in doing so many churches is not just be, beyond creating a, a great place to worship, but also how to reinforce kind of the social ministries of a congregation, how to make that uh, healthier and happen, and what can the architecture as tools of ministries do to kind of make a church healthier. And so much of that is what you see behind you uh, when you experience and walk up to the church. Trying to get people to come to church and get new members to come to church is very difficult these days, so we have learned that trying to break down the barriers, trying to break down that front door, make the church transparent and make it as uh, not as anxious, as relaxed as possible, that somebody can kind of see where they're going, see what's beyond, not that they walk in through a solid door and they don't know what's beyond on the next thing. So that's really important. And creating the patio on the outside was really important. When we uh, were first engaged, uh, the committee wasn't really thinking that much. They were thinking just the interior of this. And we kind of pushed a little bit and said, that's really important space for the health of your congregation to get people to linger after. I call it chance encounters, where somebody, you'll see a friend and you'll just stop and ask, how was your weekend or how was your family or how was your health? And you just create a little um, chance to stick, to engage with that person. And it just creates a healthier church overall. So we see the church as a ministry tool and based, coupled with the ministry and the programs that you have, hopefully the, the um, space will serve you really well. The, even though we, the space was always really awkward with the addition of the, of the flat area there before, so we're, a little, we're within the space, we're a little bit smaller, but we have the exp expansion room through the bifold doors and into the narthex. So you still can seat as many as you did before. It's just uh, repositioned and a little bit more intimate. You always had a lot of white space, as we would call a lot of empty space in, this, in the room where you didn't have any chairs. So it still works very well. Um, so breaking down the barriers with the glass doors, expandability, the little coffee area, again, is trying to get people to hang out, create social social area. Um, and this marvelous piece, David, is done by Judson Studios. David Judson should be here. He's coming down from Pasadena. They have a great studio uh, up in Pasadena, and this is one of their, they bought a new facility, which he will explain, uh, and it's called a fuse glass panel. 
to take all different pieces of glass and melt it all together in a large oven. So he can explain, explain about that. And the spirit glass overhead, we had looked at different things. There was a congregation member, I don't know if that person's here today, an architect that had looked at kind of trying to create some height in the room before we had gotten started. And that was a little cost prohibitive, but what we decided to do was just cut a skylight in. And then as things evolved and talking to Judson Studios, we decided to add a skylight to the top, to which really kind of brings your eye with the blue kind of runner all the way up to the um, skylight. Uh, and the blue runner is made by a family in, I want to say, uh, Turkey. No child labor, but it, they're made, they're handmade by families. It's through Madison Contract, uh, so kind of a unique story there. Um, what else can we say? We really, really worked hard with uh, the staff and pastor and um, on the layout of the choir and the chancel. We went through many iterations of exactly the curves here for the children's ministry and choir to stand on the curve step behind us, how all that worked and the flexibility of the space for the different musicians and the piano. Um, we really wanted the piano on the other side, but because of the kitchen on this side, it really was prohibitive to, to kind of flip that around. Uh, we're still working on the kitchen area with the city. A little issue with the uh, rating of the fire door. Let us pray. Let us pray. <laughs> yeah. yes. but, but overall, uh, really a remarkable space. Uh, removing the little shelf, the light shelf that was around the perimeter really kind of expanded the space a little bit and made it taller. And then the wood slats in the ceiling uh, really gave it a richness and a warmth. Um, the furniture was made, uh, we designed it, uh, kind of uh, unique to this space, made by a, a company called D-Tank. It was made back in Chicago, Illinois, and um, shipped out here in kind of remarkable time. I think it was about four weeks or something by the time we gave it to them and said we, that we needed it by a certain date. So they did, did quite a remarkable job in a very short time period. Yep, that was uh, really important to the staff here that the acoustics of the room kind of remain as good as it was or better. Um, so we re retained an acoustician out of San Francisco. We worked with them on uh, higher end projects um, and the church was really um, adamant that we retain that. And we, I really wanted, I was pushing for the slate or for the porcelain floor just for durability, a sense of strength and um, endurance in the church. I kind of like the message it does, it sends, but it also is very functional. It doesn't hold wine stains or you don't have to maintain it at all. Um, so, um, so that coupled with I'm sorry, what was your question? The acoustics, the acoustics yes. So, um, so because of the tile floor, we really needed to absorb everything on the ceiling. And so behind the wood slats is absorptive material. And then this whole surface here is the absorptive material. So it's about two inches thick. And this is uh, it's kind of stretched canvas over it. And then it's uh, painted in the factory so it doesn't lose its absor absorptiveness. Also, the carpeting on the chancel was there. When you have live musicians, it's good to have uh, deadening sound there. The, the other reason for the tile floor and a hard surface is when you sing, when the congregation sings, it swells and you sing a little bit louder. If there's a lot of absorption around you, you tend to si sing a little bit softer. So I don't know if you've experienced that yet or not, but there should be a little bit more robust uh, singing. Even though you're Presbyterians, the, the <laughs> Chosen, frozen, uh, you still might get a little loud once in a while. Um, yes, the cross. Uh, the cross was just designed by us. It's actually a veneer, but we did some hand scraping of it to kind of give it a, rust, a rusticness. And it actually was a little bit too long, and we had to cut off the bottom, and a gifted congregation member came back and helped us out and raised it about 
the 12 inches or 14 inches or so. Also, the chairs help the acoustics. The best absorption in the room are you, <laughs> people. But when the, when the space is not filled with people, the uh, upholstered chairs kind of help balance that out a little bit. Any other questions? Is the table waterproof? Uh, no, it has a veneer, or it's a veneer at top, and then it has a, a lacquer finish on top, so you just need to be careful with it. Tra trays, yeah. Yeah. The table, the font, and then the pulpit. And the, and the, and the pulpit. Yeah. And the pulpit is really cool because if I get bored during my sermon, I can just like play with it. It goes up, it goes way up. Yeah, you may have noticed there is not even a clock on the back wall in this sanctuary. When it's up this high, you cannot possibly contradict me. I just want you to know that. Uh, that gives flexibility for future future staff changes. That and uh, just in case it goes too long. I think I think you're done now, David. All right. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, lighting, we added quite a few more uh, theatrical lighting. They're all LED lights, uh, so they shouldn't be burning out for forever, probably, as little as you use them. All the down lights are LED, um, uh, so there's some energy savings there. We did use a few of the old fixtures that you had. Um, we also really challenged with how to light the back of the um, uh, stained glass panels. And Judson came down. I was trying to light it from shining on it, and Judson came back and said, no, we just want to light the back wall. So there's some really strong LED lights that are behind it that just light the back wall. And it worked, worked really well. Uh, <laughs> yes? The ones in the back, or which ones are you talking about? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can work on that. <laughs> we had a few of those surprises kind of along the line, along with the uh, fire smoke detector right up kind of in the middle of the space. But yeah, now you will every Sunday. I'm just trying to distract your attention from. <laughs> Challenges of building. Yes. No. Uh, we had not discussed that. There would be. You have to light from the outside, obviously. Um, but there would be a way to do that. Hmm. Uh, well, you have to light from the outside in order to see it from the inside. Unless you're trying to light it from the outside, but I don't think you can see it too well. 
from anywhere. Oh, the, the cr yes. Oh, right. Yes. Yes, there could be. That's a good transition. Just save it to us. All right. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, David, so much for, for this wonderful place. Yeah, David has also been our strong and uh, throughout the process of finding the, the most beautiful and the most economical way to do things. So we're grateful for that too. So I'm really happy to uh, also introduce you David Judson, our pair of Davids. <laughs> So David is the, the president of Judson Studios in Pasadena, who created stained glass art, a family business has been there 125 years, and I'm just going to be quiet, and you can tell us more about this, this glorious piece of art here. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's really exciting to be here. Um, Unfortunately, Tim, who d is our designer who designed and, and actually made this piece, uh, had a sick uh, daughter today, uh, actually with pneumonia, they found out yesterday. So she's, he's had to stay home. So I, I am really sorry that he's not here. Um, we are very proud to have, uh, have this piece and have it here at, uh, with Pastor Work, have, have worked with Pastor Greg. This piece is something that... Um, is very new. There's actually no, no piece that's ever been made like this before. And I'll tell you why. Um, uh, about four or five years ago, we um, started realizing that, you know, stained glass, as beautiful as it is, uh, could also be something very contemporary and, and lovely as well without losing the traditional uh, aspects of it. And so we started uh, working with, with different artists and, and um, trying different things with fusing glass. So what you see here is what we call fused glass. And that means that we can take, hey guys, <laughs> we can take different colors of glass and fuse them together, and it, and it becomes very painterly. And so even up here, you can see uh, it's almost like uh, a painting, you know, in strokes of color. And that's taking um, different colors of glass, putting them into a kiln, and fusing those pieces together. And uh, it's really uh, a magical thing. Uh, this is the first time that we ever tried anything like this. We, we really appreciated the um, kind of faith that you gave us for, for doing this. Um, we're very excited with the results of it, and I, and I think um, you should all be proud, too, to um, have done something that we think is historical. Um, and I, uh, I know lighting was a big issue, and this is the first time that I've seen it, and I think it looks spectacular. Um, and I think the, the lighting is, is very exciting uh, to um, have a window without a window, so to speak. <laughs> um, this is also uh, uh, something that's um, very exciting. I uh, went through a number of iterations. Um, there was a great committee led by Pastor Greg that uh, worked with us and gave us a lot of direction and um, a lot of trust and a lot of conversations, a lot of work. It took a long time to kind of develop the concept and work through it. And uh, it was a great experience on our end and, and we really appreciate um, uh, being in this space, in a new space here that, that uh, is really spectacular. This is, like I said, I, I haven't seen it this finished before, so it's uh, very exciting and you should all be very proud. Um, am I taking questions or anything? <laughs> Does anybody have any questions about the glass or anything? Yes, sir. There's quite a bit, actually. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> for me, but yeah, that's great. The question was if there's any hidden uh, things in the glass. And uh, he was pointing out uh, Magdalene under his arm over there on the left. Um, he saw a cave over here. You saw a cave as well as a piano with some flowers on it, which is <laughs> really amazing and, and a really exciting and fun thing that we found out about this piece as it was being made is things like that come, 
reveal themselves. Um, and, I, and I think that's one of the exciting things when, obviously, you have very in, uh, intriguing sermons here, I'm sure, but there may be some uh, times when <laughs> you may find yourself looking through the glass and finding different things. Yes? Um, sure, yeah. Um, no, uh, the, the um, concept is um, basically the story from uh, creation and God, and I don't know if you can see the figure of God kind of in the galaxy. Um, yeah, sure. So here we have the galaxy, <clears throat> and um, uh, which is the... the uh, in, uh, kind of showing creation and God. Uh, you can see kind of a, a face here. You can see a hand here. And so there's actually a figure that's kind of like the hand of God that's creating. So you see this kind of almost embrace, right, like that. And, um, and so there's this kind of sense of energy and motion coming uh, from creation and God. Um, here you see the, um, the parting of the, the, sort of the Red Sea. So you see the figures down here and the waters being parted, and uh, kind of the symbol of the mountain here in the promised land. Um, so there was a, a strong uh, sense of wa uh, a water theme, you know, and, and it's, it's symbolic here to have the, the font in front of it. And that was um, uh, something that Greg wanted us to kind of think about, that the, the font being here and the importance of the font and, and baptism. And that's kind of what drove a lot of the, the design concept here. Um, we have the tree kind of in a way coming out of the body of Christ, you know, kind of the tree of life. And you can see the tree kind of coming and connecting the whole thing, turning into creation. So there's a couple different ways of it connecting of, uh, out of creation itself and then out of uh, the body of Christ, right? And um, again, Christ was the, to be kind of a, ver a very welcoming Christ um, the, and the concept of the you know, not super identifiable, but, but also kind of, you know, what you see in the face, you know, is, what you, is how you relate to, to Christ. And we wanted to show Mary, as you talked about here, you see the face of Mary connected. And um, there is uh, some, you may see this here. This was kind of like a uh, disciple casting the net, right? This is kind of creating the, the missionary work, the fishers of men. And... Um, and that's kind of like our mission, right? To, to go out and be active as, uh, as Christians. And um, so I hope I'm not taking away all your sermons here. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, with the, the gardens, you know, it's kind of like um, flowers and, and gardens in this sense of resurrection and, and uh, 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 Christ risen and, you know, kind of a sense of Easter and that kind of thing. So a lot of different things. There's probably more here that I'm missing, but that's, that's kind of a lot of the uh, initial elements. Yes? Uh, up here? Over here, yeah. Um, there could be. I'm not. I'm not too sure about that. Some of it. Uh, some of those things are accidental. Believe it or not, you know. But it, uh, they, we do. Like I said, we're, we're finding things in this window that we didn't necessarily plan on. Yes. The process of how it's made. Okay. Yeah. So the fusing is a um, is a. Um, a new thing. So I'll go, I'll go into, I'll give you a little bit of history about the material of glass. And glass um, basically is sand and silica and then mineral oxides that make the color, right? So like um, cobalt makes blue, um, selenium makes red, and then the most expensive glass, which is, is not here because it's not, well, you see a little bit over there, but it's uh, pink. And pink is because it's gold. So you use gold to make pink. Um, and so um, the company that makes this glass that we use for fusing is called Bullseye Glass, and they're up in Portland, Oregon. And they started experimenting with glass back in the 70s um, to see how we could, you know, kind of create glass that could combine colors because generally 
glass of different colors, because of the, the, the makeup of it, um, is not compatible with itself. It, they, they expand and contract at different coefficients. So if you had a real dark blue next to a, a yellow, they would heat up at different paces. You don't have that issue here because you're not in the sun. But if it was exposed to sun, and then they would stress each other out and break. But Bullseye created a way to take different colors of glass and be able to melt them together and have the same coefficiency rate, which opens us up to a whole new thing, right? Of, of rather than being relying on just a single sheet of, of color that you see in most stained glass, or you're familiar with it with lead running through it, we now can create large panels of glass without any lead, of assemb assembling it together by hand. That being said, we didn't want to lose the sense of tradition and being able to paint, because what makes a lot of uh, stained glass, like in cathedrals and that kind of thing, so interesting is the painting on it, right? So the painting of the figures and those kind of things. And when you paint on glass, you're using a brown or black paint that gets fired into the glass, and then that is, it's, it's like the reverse. You're creating negative space, right? Because if you look at stained glass, the light's coming from behind it, right? It's not, it's not like a looking at a painting in a museum where you're looking at reflected light. With glass, you're looking with transmitted light. So we took our kind of, uh, we'd, we'd trained ourselves to be very good in a traditional sense, and we can, you still paint. So you see the, the face there, that's, um, the way we started was creating uh, very large, clear sheets of glass that are the size that you see here. So behind the color that you see is a base of clear. And that clear then can be painted on. So we take our traditional form of painting, paint on there to create outlines and create details, um, and then put the fused glass on top of that, on the clear piece, and then put it in the kiln and fire it all together. And so we're able to create these um, kind of amazing uh, combinations of traditional glass painting with, with the fusing. And um, uh, we're very excited about, like I said, this is the first time that we've ever done anything like this, and we're really excited about its possibilities. Yes, sir? Sorry, your machine burning at We fired it up to about 13, anywhere from 13 to 1,500 degrees. So we have um, uh, these large electric kilns now. We, we actually had to open another facility to do this type of work. I don't know if anybody's been to Jedden Studios, but it's, uh, it's about a 100-year-old 100, uh, 100 building, about 120 years old now. And um, you need a, a lot of large, uh, we have eight foot by four foot kilns that we can put these pieces in. So we pushed it, like that one on the far right is the biggest piece that we'd ever fired before. And um, so we're real excited to see that put in. And um, so they uh, go into the kiln, and the beauty of it is that you can fire it. It basically has to fire for about 24 hours, sometimes 30 hours. It fires. And then when we pull them out, we can actually rework them if we want to. So say, oh, well, that doesn't look exactly the way we want it to. You can go back and paint on it. You can put more glass on it. And you can create, continue to create the effects that you're going for and refire them. I mean, uh, there's a, probably a limit to the number of firings, but that's, it, it, it really does open us up to a whole new process. Um, some of the other things is the, the, the glass is, is, is sheet glass, but it's also frit. So frit is basically um, the same glass, but it's ground up. And we, we can get it in four different sizes from bullseye, from like a sand almost to gravel, uh, of four different sizes. So if you look at some of these areas that, that you see here that are kind of almost like a brush, like the tip of a brush touching it, this is um, uh, frit that's creating. Uh, these effects and also creating transitions of color. So if you just put a sheet next to a sheet, it's a very sharp uh, transition. But if you use um, the, the another uh, the, the fritz, you can create transitions of color and make them soft. Um, the other really interesting thing we're finding is that we can create, if you take that frit and you put it in the kiln and you fire it, it creates a, these amazing organic shapes. And it's a piece of glass in itself that can then be placed on. So you see like this one here was actually like a pink frit that was fired beforehand to create these kind of clear circles around it. And then when we fused, we, we took that piece and put it on with the other sheet and frit um, uh, there. You'll also see some of these kind of wild um, pieces like this. This is what we call vitrograph. And we can put, put the glass in a kiln um, actually in a flower pot with a hole in the bottom of it. And there's a hole in the bottom of the flower pot and a hole in the bottom of the kiln. You heat up that kiln and the glass starts coming out of the hole in the bottom of the, of the kiln. 
and you can pull that glass with some nice gloves. You can pull that glass and uh, create these amazing shapes that we then, when it cools, again, place it on the sheet before we fire it again to create these, um, uh, these wonderful effects. And um, so it's pretty amazing because now, uh, and our designers working on the computer, whatever they can draw on the computer can basically be done in glass, really. Yes, sir. Um, that's a good question. Uh, Tim, who's our main designer, is in his mid-40s. The rest of my designers are um, 30s. Uh, we even have some 20-year-olds now. Yeah, when I started at the studio in 96, um, that was one of the first things I ran into. The problems I ran into was that all of my, all of my the artists that worked for my father were basically retirement age. And I thought, okay, that's, that's a problem. We gotta figure that out. So we, um, I actually opened up an art gallery, and I, and I opened up, I brought a lot of artists in, we did shows, and I said, somebody's got to be interested in this medium. And, uh, and that's, that's how Tim and some of the artists have come to us. We're lucky, too, up in Pasadena, we have Art Center, so we've had a couple uh, kids out of Art Center come. And um, uh, our, our new studio now really is pushing to work with other artists who don't work in stained glass. And so we're trying to offer them the opportunity to, uh, most of them painters, uh, work in glass to create, um, you know, now some, some amazing creations and, and think about glass a little bit differently. So, so there is a future in stained glass, we hope. <laughs> I hope. Yes, ma'am. Are you still doing the traditional glaze? Yes. We are, uh, the question is if we're doing traditional, still doing traditional glass. And uh, interestingly enough, one of our biggest projects right now is a very traditional uh, monastery that's being built up in Wyoming. And uh, it's a very traditional leaded, painted uh, stained glass. So you would think if you could do this, why would you do that? But it's still very beautiful. Yeah, it's very, yeah, they, all, they, they have, they, and there's room for both. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, yeah, well, it takes one firing to make the base sheet, the clear sheet that I was telling you about. So that's one firing. A second firing would be um, uh, with most of the color. So most of these went through two, there possibly three, and might maybe even four. But most of them just two firings. Yeah, we got we got lucky. <laughs> yes. Yes, yeah, <clears throat> that's a good question too. So the question is how do we work with uh, uh, kind of a composition like this one panel at a time? And um, we have in our studio, we have 16 light tables to work on. So these are laid out on light tables and we work on them on light tables as they're being uh, constructed. And as they're, um, as they're fired and made, then we have uh, one side of our studio is all glass. And so we're able to put up the panels in, in the window and so as we're making it, we're, we're, we're looking at each panel as it's made. And work, work I, I, believe, um, I believe the Christ figure was the first figure that was made in this, panel, in this window. And then, uh, and then worked out from uh, right to left there. Yes? <laughs> we, yeah, we, have, uh, we transport it by, um, by our own trucks, so we, we do all of our own um, uh, moving and installation of the, of the panels. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. Yeah, we um, are, I'm working on the history of the, the Judson Studios, and this is definitely a part of the history, so this will be included in the book, and we did want this as part of the book. Um, part of it is just it's really hard to write a book, so it's taken me a lot longer than I expected. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yes, this will definitely be uh, one of the important pieces in the book, yes. Let's do one more question. JD, you have one? Yeah. How durable is this material? I know it's going to take glass. Yeah. Uh, well, glass is an amazingly durable material, and, and um, as long as nothing impacts it, like a, a very sharp object striking it, it'll last longer than any of us. You know, if you think about it, uh, the stained glass in the cathedrals in Europe are over a thousand years old. And so glass as a medium itself is a very stable material. And this being um, on the in, in the interior without any exposure at all, 
really, these, these will last. That's the beauty of what we think and what is attractive to the artists as well, is that you can make something that will last forever. Because the color, like I, m I mentioned earlier, is in the mineral oxides. So it's a stable. It's not like you're mixing it and, and like a paint or something like that. That's a permanent color. That color will never change. Even if that was taking sun every day, the color in the glass would not change. So. Oh, gosh. I don't think it is. It's a good point. Yeah, we'll have to. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for having me. Thank you, Dave. And thank you, David and David, both of you for being here on this special day. Just one more intentional thing about the stained glass. Uh, over here, you have you have God the Son. Who are we missing? God the Holy Spirit. There's a Trinitarian theme. To the, these pieces all both go together. So let's take two minutes and then we'll begin worship.